For those who weren't here in the beginning, I'm Father Chris Gaffrey. I'm a Franciscan, and you now know a little bit about me, but you still don't know me, right? Right. We know the difference. There's a difference between knowing something about a person and knowing a person. I don't just know about Father Patrick Gilbert. I have met him, and I'm in a prayer group together with him of other priests, so I know a little bit about him, and I know him somewhat. But we could say that there's still room for that relationship to grow. Likewise, brothers and sisters, oftentimes for us, we can reduce our faith to knowing about God, but not knowing God. There's a difference. Knowing about God is something that one can put in one's head and then answer a religion test on and get maybe a hundred or 105 if you answer the extra credit, right? But that's not the same thing as knowing God the Father, knowing God the Son, and knowing the Holy Spirit. The reason why our world puts so much emphasis on head knowledge is because our concept from the world of our identity goes a little bit like this. Knowledge is power, according to the world, right? Right? Okay, we've heard that saying before. We can debate on whether that's true or not. Knowledge is power. It's power to do something. So you have to know stuff in order to do stuff, according to the world, right? Right. You got to know stuff to do stuff. And when you do stuff, then you can have stuff, right? And then when you can know stuff, do stuff, and have stuff, you are somebody, How many times when you ask somebody who they are, do they tell you what they do? You ever notice that? Say, oh, who are you? Well, I'm a lawyer. Okay, you just told me what you do. That's what you maybe do for a living. That's not necessarily who you are. The kingdom of God is different. Instead, we begin with our identity. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. These words that we hear the Father speaking to Jesus... We don't just look at at them and just cheer as if Brady was throwing a touchdown pass. I'm sorry, he's no longer with the Patriots. So whoever the quarterback of the Patriots is now, throwing a touchdown pass, and then we just cheer. No. We as Christians don't hold these mysteries up about Jesus simply to look at them. Instead, we're called to participate in them. Jesus goes to get baptized in the Jordan in order to stand in our place, to, to, to make himself and to identify himself with sinners. Because then he talks about his passion as a baptism. So he links the two. He links his death on the cross with what happened in the Jordan River, the baptism. Because... Then later he would instruct the disciples to go forth and to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we know that when we are baptized, we are baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection. So these words that the Father speaks to Jesus today, which we hear, should echo in our hearts. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Because Jesus has died for us. He has opened the gates of heaven, not just so that we can be concerned about where we go after we die, though important that may be, but so that we can live even now as beloved sons and daughters of God. So that's why for the kingdom of God, identity is first. We are beloved sons and daughters of God. And since we are beloved sons and daughters of God, we then have all of the blessings that heaven has. Imagine the number of blessings. Do we, do we want to know how it's true that we have all these blessings? We just have to listen to what the Mass says. In the first Eucharistic prayer, one of the things that we say is, when we receive the precious body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus, we receive every blessing in the heavens. Every blessing. St. Paul says, I has not seen nor ear has heard what God has waiting for those who love him, Right? There is an inheritance that we're all called to receive. And God, through the scriptures and through the church, has told us that the down payment of all the blessings that we're supposed to receive 
is the gift of the Holy Spirit himself. So if the down payment of God's blessings is God himself, I wonder what all those blessings are. See, it's a different way of looking at things. We are beloved sons and daughters of God. We have all of the blessings of heaven. We have all the resources of heaven because God is for us, not against us. Therefore, we get to do the works of the Father. Jesus said, those who believe in me will do the works that I do and greater still because I'm going to the Father. And because he goes to the Father, he ascends. What, who comes down upon the church after the ascension? The Holy Spirit at Pentecost, right? And we participate in that through the sacraments. So we, our beloved sons and daughters of God, have all the blessings in the heavens, get to do the works of God. As we heard in that first reading, God has sent us, sent his spirit upon us so that we may truly open the eyes of the blind, not just physically. I mean, not just spiritually, but physically too. Because this is the promise of those who are beloved sons and daughters. And then we end in a different kind of knowledge of God. Not a head knowledge of God, but the knowledge of God that says, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. That's the knowledge that God has for us. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. It is a goodness that manifests itself here first. And then says, if you think that's great, just wait till you get to heaven. It doesn't say, oh, just wait till you get to heaven, because then you'll have the blessings. No, it says, taste and see here. The goodness of God, so that you have all the hope of the promises that God has made will be fulfilled because he begins to fulfill them here and now. The reason why we know this is true, brothers and sisters, is because we pray every single time we gather together as Christians at this altar. We are instructed by God, instructed by our Lord Jesus to say to God, thy kingdom come. And that's in Greek. That's a command word. That's not just a wish word. Literally, what we're saying is, thy kingdom, come. Thy will, be done. When? On the last day when Jesus comes again? No. Now, on earth as it is in heaven. We're literally calling the blessings of heaven to be existing here on earth. But this is important for us, brothers and sisters, because in order for us to know our identity as beloved sons and daughters of God... We have to know what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. How many of you heard that in the, in, both in the antiphon before the gospel and in the gospel itself and wondered what that meant? When John the Baptist says that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. How many of you wondered what that meant? A couple. One person at least is listening and is honest that they might wonder what that means, Right? Well, the church has said what this means, the past three popes at least, Pope Francis, Pope Benedict XVI, St. John Paul II, have spoken about baptism of the Holy Spirit as being the stirring up and fanning into flame of the graces that we receive in baptism, in confirmation, and in Holy Communion. One of the telltale signs of baptism of the Holy Spirit is that we know Not up here in our head, but with the heart knowledge that God the Father loves us tremendously. That we have that confidence. And though our feelings may go up and down, our confidence in the love of the Father doesn't change. Other signs of baptism of the Holy Spirit is that suddenly, Scripture no longer sounds like the parents and the adults from the Peanuts cartoons, you know, wah, 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 wah. But suddenly, Holy Spirit begins to help us to understand. Because the gifts of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah are knowledge, understanding, wisdom, courage, counsel, piety, and holy reverence of God. It's Holy Spirit's job to get us to understand what's happening in our faith. So if we don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, obviously we're not going to have that much understanding about the things of our faith. Likewise, the Holy Spirit produces within us the fruits of patience, joy, peace, charity, long-suffering, self-control, or chastity, right? 
and all sorts of other fruits that are listed in Galatians. It's exactly what it is that we might be longing for in terms of our spiritual life, where we are looking for the good fruit that shows that we are growing away from sin and toward God. And I know this is the case as a spiritual director myself. I know that so many people basically think that it's their job to do all of that, and it's not. It's our job to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can produce those fruits in us. It's Holy Spirit's job. So if you're lacking one of those things, ask Holy Spirit, right? But also, we are called as a Christian community to be able to witness to the power of God. And so Holy Spirit gives us also the charismatic gifts. These are freely given. They're not based on our holiness, It's the fruits of the Holy Spirit that would be signs of our holiness. But the charismatic gifts, the ability to work signs and wonders so that others may come to believe, are signs not so much how much God loves us, but how much God loves other people and wants them to also be invited into the community of God, to be brought forth, to receive what God has for them. And so God will stir up and fan into flame those gifts within the Christian community. They are to be well discerned, but they're to be welcomed and fostered. So, it's very simple. Knowledge is one thing. Understanding is another, right? You can know that a light bulb goes into a um, light socket, right? But to understand, oh, the reason why it turns on is there's electricity and all that stuff, so if something is busted in there, it won't work, right? And then it's wisdom to actually go and screw the light bulb in, right? Because wisdom isn't about knowledge. Wisdom is about acting. Jesus said to us that those who act on his word, not just listen to it, but those who act on his word are like those who build their house upon a rock. Well, this is the granite state, so I assume that most houses are on rock, right? Mostly granite, right? He said that those who don't listen to his word excuse me, those who listen to his word but don't act on it then are like those who build their house upon sand. And he says the same thing happens to both houses. The wind comes, the rain comes, the flood comes, and one of the houses stands, the other gets swept away. I imagine it's the one built on rock, right? The one where somebody acts upon God's word. And St. James in his letter also says that we're called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. So it's very simple. We may not know what this baptism in the Holy Spirit entails, but we can still act on it. Those who talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit mention that it's kind of like this. And St. Thomas Aquinas mentions this too. So that's weird. A Franciscan just mentioned St. Thomas Aquinas. Take note. You know, the rivalry between the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Okay. Funny thing. The parish I'm at down in Derry is St. Thomas Aquinas. It's hysterical. <clears throat> He said this, we can receive graces validly through the sacraments, but somehow what happens is if we don't receive it with faith or the right kind of faith, those graces remain a bit dormant. It's kind of like, and people will say this, the analogy of you take some milk and you pour some chocolate milk syrup into it, and what happens? It goes to the bottom. Everybody knows that, right? Especially if you try to make chocolate milk for a a fussy three-year-old, right? (laughs) You have to take the spoon, and what do you have to do? You have to stir it up. St. Paul said to Timothy in one of his letters, be sure to stir up and fan into flame the gift that you have received through the imposition of hands. How many of you are confirmed? Which is the sealing of our baptism, right? And we get to stir up and fan that into flame. So I'd like to close with us acting on God's word. It's very simple. We might not know what baptism the Holy Spirit is in terms of intellectually in all its capacity. We understand a little bit about it from today. But we can get hungry for something that we maybe didn't know existed and say, okay, God, I'm asking for that. And that's the wisdom part. That's the acting on the word part. And interesting thing, last month, In Nashua, I was preaching to high schoolers. They were completely and totally oblivious to anything I was saying until I started to talk about how people get healed. And um, 
after I had them act on God's word, some of them got healed during communion. I didn't even tell them that that was possible. It just happened. And I asked them because I could feel the shift in the spirit during communion. And I said, you know, hey, how many of you feel differently? And a bunch of them raised their hands. I said, how many of you actually can measure physical healing? And a couple of them raised their hands. When we act on God's word, something gets unlocked. So if you're comfortable, you don't have to do this. But if you're comfortable, put your hands out as if you're receiving. Because God has gifts for us today. And if you're comfortable, repeat after me. Father God, I may not know everything about what baptism in the Spirit means. But I sure want it. Because Scripture says, Jesus is going to baptize me with Holy Spirit and fire. I say yes to that, God. Stir up and fan into flame the gift of the Spirit that you gave to me in baptism, confirmation, every good holy communion, and every good holy confession. I say yes to the gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And even the weird charismatic gifts of the Spirit. And I say yes, God, to anything else you want to give me today. Thank you, Father God. Most importantly, Father, may the words that you spoke to Jesus, you are my beloved child. Become more than something intellectual for me today. Help me to know, Father, through this Mass, the great love you have for me and others. In Jesus' holy name, amen.